Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. It's really great to be here at CHS, and I'm really excited to speak to such a cross-disciplinary audience. Today, I'm going to present a very abbreviated overview of the last 12 years of my artistic practice, and I hope that you'll see the traces of the ancient world that permeate it. Whether I'm talking about science fiction, labor issues, or materiality, the underpinnings of my form and my thought are rooted in the past and mostly in the ancient Hellenic world. Um, so though I'm going to go over some broad themes in my work, I, I'd like to ask you to think of them more as an ever-evolving set of interests or preoccupations that keep me engaged, that keep me making things, rather than as a concrete post-game analysis in the way an art historian or a critic might apply them. Um, I might sound, sound kind of kooky sometimes. Um, so before I show you anything at all, um, there's a few evolving sets of ideas I'd like to introduce. One involves a particular concept of materiality, one involves a reckoning with time, and one the relationship between material process and form. I'm going to start by showing you my graduate thesis. Um, although this was 12 years ago, we're going to spend some time here. Uh, it's titled Quarry. I made it on site in my grad studio, which was part of the exhibition area. It's solid plaster with a tiny amount of concrete. Uh, to get a sense of scale, the peak of the wedge is about seven and a half feet tall, and hypotenuse across the front is about 17 feet. The total weight of the material is over 14,000 pounds, and I built it by myself in five weeks. So why would a person do this? Um, there's a lot of reasons, and they may or may not make sense together to an outsider, because remember, I'm speaking as a maker not as a classicist, a critic, or an art historian, but as a person swimming freely in form, thought, and history. Um, to evoke the artist Claire Pentecost, the artist is a public amateur, someone who consents to start with, I don't know, and to learn in public. And that's definitely the way I've approached uh, my art making practice. So when you study the history of Western sculpture, you come across the stories of the great artists, right? There's these celebrated stories about Michelangelo going to Carrara to select the marble for his sculptures before it was even pulled from the mountain. I assume that other people weren't doing that, which is why it became a celebrated story. Um, it doesn't seem like an artist could go much farther back in the process of making a sculpture than to the mountain itself. So does anything come before the mountain? I thought, wait, what made the mountain, right? Geology, minerals, heat, pressure, time. Ever since childhood, I've been fascinated by the ancient world and prehistory, but this was my first introduction to thinking about very deep time, to geologic time. So then I thought, well, what if I made the mountain? But we're gonna take a little detour. Um, imagine a simplified idea of making a sculpture. It might look like an arrow or a vector with material at its beginning and form at its end. The arrow or vector itself is called process, P. A vector has a direction and beginning and an end. At the beginning of our vector is the raw material M, at the end is the form F. F is reached by performing P, process upon M, the material. So here's a classic philosophical thought experiment related to the Sorites paradox. It's a simple gradient. One end is red, the other end green. Between them is the full infinite range of colors blending red into green. The question is, where can one draw the line that defines the red side of the gradient from the green side, separating the colors that are red from those that are not red? Anywhere a cut is made in the gradient, the two hues on either side of that cut will be infinitesimally close together and therefore indistinguishable, thus the paradox. I see a corollary between this problem and the relationship between material and form that I just outlined. So what if our vector actually looked like this? Again, when does form become material? Anywhere a cut is made, the two stages are infin infinitesimally close together and therefore indistinguishable. I see that as a problem. So it occurred to me that a way out of this problem might be to avoid the entire idea of a cut by creating a circuit from the vector, bending it and turning it back on itself, creating what I like to think of as a feedback loop of materiality. The process is the engine that keeps that loop turning. One begins with material and via process comes to a state of form and material existing simultaneously. 
So material begets both form and material and continues on from there without a cut. The new form is also the new material, pregnant with the potential of a yet unknown future form. Perhaps history, as well as material, can be reused in this way to re-inhabit it without replicating it. Quarry was the first time I tried to do this, to use material to make a form that was also new material, something that held the potential for a yet unknown future form. The material was plaster ribboned with concrete, creating a simulation of white marble. The forms that I chose to extricate or quarry from my self-made massif were by necessity, many shapes and sizes, but I did have a goal in mind to quarry vertical blocks suitable for figural sculpture. A vertical block is a figure, just like um, how in your printer settings, if you are printing vertically, it's called portrait mode. And if you're printing horizontally, it's called landscape mode, right? So I strive for an uncracked, for uncracked vertical blocks that truly held the potential for figuration. This one was my favorite. <laughs> So this is all very well and good and a rather analytical take on what was actually a grueling body breaking process. So how did I extricate these blocks? I actually had no idea when I started this where I was going to end up. Remember this idea of the public amateur and then learning sort of performatively. I built myself into a corner and I had to sculpt my way out. Along the way, I did research into quarrying techniques, ancient and modern, but I had to adapt them to deal with the reality of what was before me, 14,000 pounds of set but not dry musty plaster. So I got a heavy duty hammer drill with a half inch by 24 inch bit, a sawzall with an 11 inch coarse tooth blade, and I fabricated my own five foot chisel chisels from steel bar stock in the metal shop and I got down to business. You can clearly see the traces of my action on the blocks. And at the time, you could clearly see the results of Corey's actions upon my body. I was bruised and I had gotten very strong. Shortly after graduating, I began working on my first New York solo show at Laurel Gitlin's uh, first space in New York, which was tiny. This was in 2010. The exhibition felt like a clear development of the, tra of the train of thought for my thesis work. The show was called Ozymandias. And the piece I'm showing you here is called If I Was a, but then again, no. It filled the entire main space of the gallery. Similar to Quarry, it's made of plaster and a tiny bit of concrete, but this time it had a drywall skin on it. It was the first time I'd used drywall, which is a material that came up frequently for me. How we most, it's also how we most often come across gypsum in daily life. Simultaneously, I was thinking about plaster as the material of the dissemination of classical figural statuary throughout Western Europe during the Enlightenment 19th and early 20th centuries, and the main vehicle for our contemporary misunderstanding of the Hellenic world. The piece was cast as a solid mass with a footprint of a four by eight foot piece of drywall. And I wanted to cut it into 18 64 inch tall by 16 inch square blocks, standard construction dimensions. But again, like in quarry, I had no idea how I was going to do it. What I didn't quarry wasn't going to cut it here because of the shift in scale and shape. I now had to cut across, across four feet of solid damp plaster. Ultimately, I bought a seven foot antique two person logging saw and took on seven interns, one for each day of the week to work the other side of the saw with me. Uh, I had to learn how to sharpen each of its hundred teeth individually because the abrasiveness of the plaster dulled them daily. Once it was finally cut, I then had to figure out how two people my size could move 800 pound vertical blocks to separate them from each other so they could begin to dry. At the time, I was listening to the British Museum's History of the World and 100 Objects podcast, which is amazing, as I worked in the studio. So I was thinking a lot about ancient builders and how they would have done it. So I ended up developing a sister of, system of uh, levers and rollers. Uh, this is like my favorite shot of me working in the studio ever. There's not many. <laughs> Again, I think it's important for me to emphasize here that these processes were not premeditated. They were on the fly, desperate fixes to sculpt my way out of a bad situation. And I'm extremely glad for it. It keeps me interested and it keeps the work fresh and exciting. I don't want to use a predetermined technique. I want to invent my own. Because when you make new materials, you must make new processes, no matter how low tech. And for me, that's where things get interesting. 
Here's a quick close up of the block surfaces. You can see the marbling of the concrete, the various tool marks, and that brown is actually rust from the logging saw. Um, there were three works in the back room. Um, just know that one of them involved a fairly happy live octopus, which, which is a long story. Um, just always like to keep people guessing. So we're going to skip ahead to 2013 now and look at a couple of works from my second show at Laurel Gitlin. Um, by now, she had moved into a much larger gallery. The show was titled Cortege after the poem by Apollinaire. One thing that I began thinking about more seriously at that time was the relationship between sculpture and architecture and their materials. For thousands of years, sculpture and architecture were intrinsically linked. Sculpture existed as a part of architecture. Grand architecture always included sculpture. They weren't just physically and conceptually integrated, but they were materially unified. Marble temple, marble sculpture, limestone cathedral, limestone sculpture. Even terracotta was used for both bricks and sculptures. But that's certainly not the relationship of sculpture and architecture today, either in terms of its physical integration or its materials. When and how did they diverge? Could they be reintegrated? It's a question very much on my mind, especially in terms of materials. What would sculpture made with contemporary architecture, architectural materials look like? And what are those materials anyway? So in these slides, you can see a series of works I made called weight bearing. They're made of screwed together stacks of 16 by 16 inch drywall squares. There's that dimension again, uh, carved with a sawzall into contrapposto karyatid forms supporting an I-beam. So here again, I made a new material similar to the big pieces in my first two shows. These are also the first quasi figural sculptures I ever made. And they're also the first instance in which I used a post and lintel form, which is another important form for me. I love the post and lintel. I sort of think of it as like fur architecture. Um, I think the amazing thing about post and lintel architecture is that it's thousands of years old, but it's still in wide use today. Ancient temple architecture, of course, is famously post and lintel, but maybe so are the bones of the building in which you're sitting right now. Um, it's just a simple function of physics, which feels to me very close to a kind of elementality or universality that really excites me. I don't know if anyone here has read, actually, you know, a few of you here have read Kubler's The Shape of Time, <laughs> a couple of former students of mine. Um, and his, his writing has continually pushed me and awed me. So I feel like this reckoning with the post and lintel form, for me, comes from my reading of Kubler and his ideas of object forms persisting through time. There's another one. Um, in the back room of this exhibition, there were four works, three clads and a bronze work called Hygrophysis. It's a winged phallus engaging with an octopus. I'd really like to speak more about the octopus works, but it's not easy to do it quickly, so I have to leave it alone for today. Um, that said, it's always been really important for me to include a work or two in an exhibition that sort of functions as what I like to call a joker in the deck of cards, um, especially in shows that can begin to feel materially homogenous. So it kind of functions as like a trickster figure that maybe upends a lot of what a viewer maybe thought they thought about a particular show. In 2013, I also began making a series of labyrinths. This is the first one I made, and it was part of an exhibition called Build On, Build Against at Non Objectif Sud, a resin residency in the south of France. Um, the base of my proposed labyrinth is built to US construction standards, again, that 16 by 16 inch grid with a steel stud rising from each intersection. Uh, the path of the labyrinth is 16 inches wide, just wide enough to barely squeeze through. It's made of the same studs forming the same structure at the same scale as common interior walls of the sort built in every American, or in this case, French home before they get their drywall. A labyrinth is not a maze. Can't say that enough. <laughs> a labyrinth is linear. There is only one path to follow. There are many turns, but there are no wrong turns. The path twists and confuses the traveler, but it's just one line bent back upon and upon itself. Despite the feeling of retreading the same path, in a labyrinth, you're always moving forward. Unlike the dark construct containing the Minotaur, my labyrinth has no surface, no walls, no barriers to free movement. We can see through the structure of studs, our gaze slices smoothly through the form, cutting irregular lengths of the twisted line. The viewer is presented with a choice to follow the tight winding linear path or to cut through 
either with their body or eyes and define their own. Like the path that creates the labyrinth, time is linear and exists alongside the three spatial dimensions. In our everyday experience of time, we can't move around freely like we can in space. This labyrinth serves as a proposition for a new experience of time. The visitor can choose whether to follow the linear path laid out or to cut a new path through the form as they wish, defying linearity and disrupting the arrow of time. Also in 2013, which was a really busy year, um, I had my first solo museum exhibition in the upstairs gallery at Kunsthalle Basel in Basel, Switzerland, titled The Plural Present. Any classicists out there and archaeologists get bonus points for being able to identify uh, all of the <laughs> a couple of things here. <laughs> um, Kunsthalle Basel is an intimidatingly gorgeous, soaring, and huge neoclassical space. Both this show and the previous one were made entirely overseas. Um, I lived and worked in France and Switzerland for almost four months. And everything you see was made in that time frame. Nothing was shipped from New York. So I always begin conceptualizing my shows by looking at the floor plans first. This is practical because I'm extremely concerned with how a viewer experiences the show physically, visually, and in what sequence, but it's also a conceptual decision. If I'm serious about the reintegration of architecture and sculpture, then my first concern is to respond to the architecture that's given to me. In this case, the room was a long, vast rectangle with doors on opposite diagonal corners, creating a single diagonal pathway across the space to the next room. Now, I knew I didn't want people just making a beeline from one door to the next. I wanted to slow them, force them to walk around and around the show, seeing it from different angles and different framings, to slow their passage and slow their viewing. In order to disrupt that natural diagonal, I created massive stud walls to force the visitor to cross the space three times in a very long S shape to get to the next room. These walls are about 19 feet tall and 65 feet long each. Uh, they are one work and they're titled The Long Walls. Each wall begins right at the inside lintel of the door and extends almost the length of the entire gallery, collapsing and torquing under their own weight until they touch the wall that they echo. There's a pretty great, I love that photo of it. <laughs> this, they had a really great photographer for this exhibition. Um, leaning against the long walls were 10 clads, which is a long standing series of work that I, I made, uh, made from the cutoffs and detritus from making Beauty, Mirth, and Abundance, which was a sculpture in the center of the space that you haven't seen yet. The clads are 16 inches wide and 64 inches tall. That's my size. <laughs> As you can tell, it's a scale I use a lot. It's my dimensions combined with construction dimensions. Here's the clads framed through the walls as you would see them while passing through the exhibition. In the center of the room was a large work called Beauty, Mirth, and Abundance, or The Three Graces, named and modeled after the Roman copy in the Metropolitan Museum. And that sculpture has this incredible rhythm of contrapposto. The sculpture in the Met has no heads. In my version, I replaced the heads with a prefab concrete drainage pipe, creating a circular head form in one direction that actually connected the sight lines between the two doors and a lintel form in the other. The figures are made from a cheap, local, ubiquitous Swiss brick called Swiss module. The name is actually stamped all over them. I carved them with an angle grinder and a diamond cutting wheel. And so it was amazing to see the interior forms that resulted, which was another fantastic surprise from throwing myself at something I'd never done before. This is the view of the piece from one door to the other uh, in the diagonal across the gallery. And here's just a couple of different views of beauty, mirth, and abundance. Now I'm just gonna quickly flip through a couple of the clads so you can see what the surface actually looks like after I work it slightly. I make a new material, but then I do carve it or sculpt it, paint it or polish it just a little. I kind of let the material tell me what it needs, what it wants to fully be itself. And so we have a full view and a close up. The plural present then traveled to the Swiss Institute in New York. Um, in total, the show was up for about six months between the two spaces. 
In contrast, this work, Colossus, was a piece that existed for five days. <laughs> it was made of baled post-industrial plastics compressed into striated half-ton cyclopean building blocks. Um, lying on their sides in a loose line, the blocks lean on each other in a kind of natural repose, suggesting a massive collapsed architecture. I actually um, showed this image the last talk I gave, and one of the art history students in the room actually was able to identify what um, famous piece of architecture this is <laughs> echoing. And um, yeah, bonus points to anyone who can identify it. <laughs> I was really impressed. Nobody had ever figured out what it actually, what I had modeled it on before. <laughs> um, compressed bales of plastic have attracted me as a building material for years because they suggest the massive scale and solidity of ancient construction. But even though they invoke ancient materials, in reality, these blocks are a 21st century commodity, a new raw material, a global industrial waste product collected and baled into blocks for sale by the pound. Each one weighed approximately 1,000 pounds and um, goes for about 30 cents, cents a pound in terms of commodity prices. So I sourced the blocks from a recycling plant in New Jersey. Oh, also this is uh, 2015 now. Most of this plastic started its life in China as wrappings for furniture and other large goods. Those goods were then shipped to the US. Then after the plastic was collected and baled, those blocks are then sold back to processing plants in China, shipped there all the way from New Jersey. Once there, this plastic then gets downcycled into a lower grade plastic. That plastic is then processed once again and made into cheap consumer goods, which are then shipped all the way back to the US for sale in big box stores. Um, so how many times will this plastic travel across the globe? I became really fascinated by the strange cycle of material transformation that both feeds on and into disposable consumerism. As I'm sure you've gathered, I often think about material cycles and the persistence of elemental forms of architecture and sculpture over time. When considering huge swaths of time, the quick changes just drop away. Big gestures and physical facts remain. Think of how much material it takes to make a city and how different that material is from what lies around it. Humans have created vast concentrations of previously non-existent materials and also concentrated extant materials in strange and unusual quantities and mixtures. We all know that thousands of years from now, our cities will stand as ruins. But in tens of millions of years, our cities won't even won't be ruins. They will be geological strata crushed and compressed under eons of planetary scale heat and pressure. What new stone created from the metamorphosed remains of human civilization will form the building blocks for the next ascendant species if it's one that's inclined to build? Yeah, so that's the kind of thing I think about. <laughs> so now we're really time traveling. <laughs> Um, I'm not showing them all to you today. This is, should be black right now. Um, but from uh, between 2013 and 2015, I produced four shows living overseas in France, Switzerland, Greece, Brazil, each time, uh, also Toronto, uh, each time incorporating local construction vernacular in materials, forms, and processes. But after that, I started thinking about my next New York show and realized that I'd never made a show that was specifically New York in its materials and forms, which is important. This is my home. When I thought of what New York looks like, what its quintessential materials are, what kept forcing its way to the forefront of my mind was scaffolding, steel scaffolding, construction debris netting, sidewalk bridges, the perpetual destruction and construction of the city, new glass luxury towers popping up like mushrooms after the rain. As Josh Klein wrote for my press release, the money that could sustain a middle class frozen in place as glass, steel, and concrete. But on street level, that looks like scaffolding. Like the baled plastic, these were materials on my radar for some time. This show was titled Disinherited. The architecture of the entire gallery, including the doorway, is shrouded in construction debris netting, stretched across right, bright red steel post shores, creating a light geometric echo two feet out from the existing walls. Light though it was, the netting made the space where the work hung become literally inaccessible. I cut flaps through the netting, creating what I thought of as sculptural niches or ghostly frames for the wall works. The wall works are made of dissolved styrofoam with collaged language from plastic shopping bags transferred onto them in a sort of concrete poetry graphic configuration. The titles reflect the language within each piece. You shop, you please, you do your part. 
more have less pay, a nice day, 24 hours, seven days a week, shopping for savings for shopping, please, 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 the power guaranteed, new lower of low, now even lower, you, us, it's personal. This was the first time I used language of any kind in my work. I'm still not entirely comfortable with it, and that's okay. It's really important to do things that feel off, that feel risky, and to make yourself vulnerable in your work. If you don't, no boundaries get pushed for yourself or for anyone else, but most importantly for yourself. Um, there was this large sculpture in the back room called Gollum, um, like the Jewish Gollum, not like the Lord of the Rings Gollum. <laughs> Its concrete foot contained remnants of the works in the front gallery. Simultaneously, I had, so Disinherited was concurrent with this show um, called A Pot to Piss In, which was just a few blocks away at Klaus von Dixagen Gallery. And it also utilized construction debris netting and plastics, but in a very different configuration. While Disinherited was blaringly white, A Pot to Piss In was dark. The gallery was small and very tall. The works were diminutive and I wanted them on the floor. So I lowered the ceiling of the gallery to four and a half feet by sewing a huge black cube of, construct of construction debris netting and suspending it from the ceiling. It forced viewers to stoop down to view the work. The gallery was filled with this shadowy void made material pressing down on the viewers, forcing them to stoop to enter bending their heads down to the works. I called that work strategic foresight. The floor works are what I call imperfect vessels. Humanity's simplest tools, vessels are ubiquitous culturally and temporally and hold an essential permanent place over the timeline of human existence. Made from melted plastic bags, they don't hold water. The plastic becomes a broken down raw material of the future. So here's another major project that I'm actually not going to delve into today because it is sort of a talk unto itself. And that's my recent book, On the Rock, The Acropolis Interviews, published by Sobers Cove Press in 2019. Um, the project was first conceived in 2014 and it took many years and a lot of support to finish. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, so the marble workers laboring on the decades long restoration of the Acropolis are the invisible force rebuilding one of the world's most storied monuments. Inheritors of millennia old tradition, few carvers exist today, fewer still pass the Acropolis entrance exams. Um, their work is a highly technical amalgam of past and present, but what these carvers do and how they do it was undocumented until this book. So as the restoration enters its final phases, this book of interviews explores the workers craft, techniques, training, and specific roles within the restoration in their own unique and very personal voices. The carvers discuss the ancient building practices, the teaching of traditional craft today, changes in the practice of architectural restoration, and the social and class dynamics within the restoration site. Um, concurrently, they discuss Greece's economic crisis from their own position, because amid, amidst uh, crippling unemployment, work on the rock continued despite radical cuts. The carvers uh, very frankly share their thoughts about their crafts, jobs, and citizenship. And so the book explores the intersect intersection of these issues through first person narration by the carvers themselves. Um, the book is actually a bilingual edition with the full text produced in both English and Greek. This is the back cover. So as you may have noticed by now, um, in my work, time is often stretched folded and twisted, the present and the future treated as if they belong to some kind of ancient archaeological site. In this new series of weavings, this is my, this is brand new work that's been made over the past sort of year, year and a half. Um, it's the work I'm currently working on. This series of weavings made from plastic bags and construction debris netting, I'm continuing my thinking about labor, craft, and the material evidence of time, while considering the knowledge and mythologies and forms of communication that we inherit from past civilizations and reiterate to the next. Um, the text that appears, these, I know it doesn't really look like it maybe, um, but there is text in here. Don't worry, you're not expected to be able to read it. Um, the text that appears in these tapestries is from the Human Interference Task Force, which is an ever-changing think tank of anthropologists, semioticians, nuclear physicists, behavioral scientists, linguists, engineers, architects, other academics, 
first formed by the US government in 1981. Uh, they are tasked with creating warnings to mark sites of buried nuclear waste. Their goal is to create physical and linguistic warnings that will be understood by human beings 10,000 years in the future. While this is still an ongoing project, they, the texts with, that they are producing, I think, read more like ancient poetry than they do like futuristic prose. There's a close up of this one. Um, these images are from an exhibition at Fall River Museum of Contemporary Art uh, from just last year. So I'm actually going to read this one to you. Just trust me that it actually does say this. <laughs> um, this one says, this place is not a place of honor. No highly esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing is valued here. This place is a message and part of a system of messages. Pay attention to it. Sending this message was important to us. We considered ourselves to be a powerful culture. Sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear there's a little yard work outside here. Um, there was a close up. So I invented my own typeface and have set it in unconventional ways. Some of it is set in Bustrophedon, a kind of bi-directional text found in some archaic Greek inscriptions. In English translation, the Greek word boustrophedon means to turn like oxen, shifting from left right to right left like the plow lines in a field. Uh, this way of writing offers a snaking form of linearity full of loops backwards and restarts, much like how I sort of like to handle time itself. Here's another close up. This piece is titled GTFO. Um, and this was created all of these works, these three were four works and the next one you're going to see, were created all during the pandemic. Um, they're created in New York during a dark year that punctuated four dark years. Um, I think of these works as warnings from the present to the future and from the future back to us. And this is the image I'll be ending on. It's my most recent um, entry into this series. I'm working on some more iconographic ones now in addition to the text-based pieces. And yeah, so now here at CHS, I'm looking into apotropaic imagery and Gorgon imagery um, and the uses of it in archaic Greek art. So on that note, I will try to stop sharing. Okay, here we are, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for going through that with me.